Hi, and welcome to Your Finance TV. We're here with Jeffrey Huge, founder at Alpha Insights. We're discussing his weekly playbook, which is available on Substack at hugeinsights.substack.com. And of course, don't forget to like and subscribe to Your Finance TV. We are through, I think we've tipped through 5,000 subscribers and keep on growing. So thank you for all your support. Jeff, welcome back. Good to see you, sir. Always great to be here, Matty. Thanks for having me on the show. So it's been a, a heavy week from a geopolitical landscape and our thoughts and prayers are with the Israelis during these atrocities. So, you know, I can't get these images off my screen. It's just, it's awful. Um, but this has certainly had less impact on the markets than one would have thought. Uh, Jeff, why don't you kick us off with your top down and your thoughts? Yeah, let me preface everything by saying that we published our latest uh, Huge Insights, the Big Picture newsletter on Saturday, October 7th. So it's basically hot off the press. And uh, in that uh, issue, we we go through a fairly, fairly detailed sort of comparative review of the United States' current situation relative to the Roman Empire at its peak. And we got a lot of feedback from uh, you know, readers, subscribers, those who have followed our work for a long time. I probably got over a hundred emails from people, all accolades, you know, people all just, you know, fascinated by it. And so I guess I would encourage your viewers to maybe tune in, take a look at that issue. If you want to get a flavor for the sort of things that we think about and how we're kind of positioning our views uh, relative to history and relative to what's going on in the current, uh, you know, uh, market, economic, and geopolitical environment, we really do um, hit it all in that publication. So, you know, with that, let me just say, uh, last week, uh, the S&P 500 saw a pretty strong key reversal day on Friday. And uh, that brought the bulls out in force, uh, you know, talking about and comparing it to the October 13th, 2022 low, which was also a key reversal day. Uh, that was... Uh, uh, an event that preceded a 26% advance in the S&P 500 from its uh, lows in October of last year to its highs in July, July 27th on the S&P intraday this year. And so, um, you know, we have to consider the fact that, you know, where are we? We're in the middle of uh, uh, actually still early October, but, you know, October is kind of known as the bear killer month. We had four consecutive down weeks in the S&P 500. It would have been five uh, if we didn't get that key reversal day on Friday. Uh, but, uh, you know, we ended up closing the week last week up half a percent, right? Uh, I wouldn't call that, uh, you know, epic by any stretch, right? You know, it was a okay, uh, you know, week uh, for the S&P. Um, you know, yesterday was an up day. Today, it looks like we're going to open up. Uh, you know, so there's there's some follow through here. But, uh, you know, I think hostilities in the Middle East, which broke out over the weekend, unfortunately, uh, will have an impact on a lot of uh, uh, capital market events here. Number one, uh, the bond market was closed yesterday. Uh, we'll see how things kind of shape up today to recover from that. Uh, no doubt we're seeing a bit of a flight to quality uh, from foreign investors as well as institutional investors. So it doesn't surprise me that the bond market will catch a bid here. Gold's been strong, another safe haven asset that's cost, caught a bid. Uh, and then we've, of course, seen energy uh, rally pretty significantly, uh, both uh, you know oil and gas futures, uh, as you know, people are concerned about whether uh, this is going to uh, you know uh, expand to include. Uh, some of the other uh, Arab countries, specifically Iran, uh, who appears to have been, you know, a strong supporter of Hamas in the past, and, and may very well have been behind, you know, the funding and weapons of this particular uh, strike. So we'll see how things play out. Uh, you know, I'm not an expert on Middle East geopolitics and strategy, but uh, you know, what I hear in the news is that uh, Israel is not taking this lightly, obviously, and uh, you know, the response is expected to be uh, beyond measured and could take several months to get through. And so you know, the question is, what's the reaction going to be out of Egypt, out of Lebanon, out of Syria, out of Jordan, out of Iran? Uh, this is all uh, something that we need to pay close attention to. It's going to be day by day, minute by minute, perhaps. Um, that being said, you know, we continue to see uh, interest rates as being the number one issue affecting the U.S. economy right now. Uh, you know, we've seen this back up in the term structure. Uh, long rates have pushed up and touched a 16-year 16-year high last Friday, 
uh, hitting just shy of 4.9%. And uh, we've pulled back from that. We got down to, you know, 465, 470-ish, you know. Um, will we hang out there for a while? Certainly possible. You know, whenever you get these big moves to the upside, uh, we need to correct those. And so I'm of the opinion that we could be in kind of a sideways to down move in rates for the next few days, perhaps weeks. But I don't think the rise to the upside is done yet. Our minimum target was 495 with upside stretch target to 540 for this particular leg. Uh, we see rates remaining much higher for much longer. Uh, we've talked about in our newsletter uh, for a number of months now, the you know potential for rates to move up into the 10, 10 and a half percent range over the next several years. I think it's going to get there in stages, not in a direct line. Uh, the next stage after we get through this five, five and a quarter, five, 540 uh, range that we think is is on the horizon here, uh, you know, could be six to 660. That's the next range in our our um, uh, work. And and we think that could be, you know, uh, something that's achieved in the subsequent, subsequent 12 to 18 months. And so uh, this, again, will happen in stages as we kind of build our way up there over the next several years. Um, that being said, you know, we think the S&P 500 is at the precipice of a third wave decline at uh, a primary degree of trend, and that could be something that carries the market substantially lower. And we'll dig into the details of that in a minute. Uh, but we continue to uh, suggest to our uh, readers and subscribers that, you know, October is a difficult month. We expect S&P prices to carry lower into uh, this month, uh, perhaps even into next month. There's a number of cycle turn dates we've got our eyes on. And uh, we think the best positioning is to be long T-bills right now, maximize cash reserves, minimize net equity, and just remain patient. Let the market tell us what is the condition going forward. And right now, it does not look bullish to us, despite the last couple of days rally. Patience, patience, patience. So, Jeff, if we dive into your note this week, you look at corrections, which are greater than negative uh, 7% in the bull market. Can you talk us through these statistics? Yeah, you know, um, this is a, a study that was put together by Milton Berg. Milton is a well-known uh, market statistician, worked for uh, Druckenmiller and Soros uh, over the years and has been on his own for a number of years now. Uh, he posted this study on Twitter, which is how we came by it. But I thought it was very interesting because, you know, we've seen a rally off the lows of over 25%. Uh, Berg says that there have been 17 bull markets uh, since 1957 in the S&P 500, where we've seen um, a max gain that exceeds 25%. So that includes this year, right? So of those 17, how many of those have seen at least a 7% correction? And, and by his work, 7% is a statistically significant correction. So that's how we ri arrive at that. It's not data mining. It's a statistically significant corrective event. And of those 17, nine saw at least one 7% correction or greater, okay? Uh, four saw at least two 7% corrections or greater. The number of uh, events where we saw three 7% corrections or greater up until this year was zero, okay? So this year is the first time we've seen three corrections of greater than 7%. Based on Berg's analysis, we can conclude that this greatly, um, you know, improves the odds that the advance off last October's low is a counter trend advance and not a new bull market based on this simple fact. So that's the point of the study. We wanted to make our uh, subscribers aware of it. Uh, it's out there in the public domain, but something we found to be pretty interesting. That is very interesting. It's always nice seeing some of these different thought processes and some of the statistics that go behind it. So looking at the stock and bond net positioning, how do you think how do you think things play out from this uh, side of the positioning? Well, you know, the, the focus is always on uh, large speculative traders, right? Because they're the ones that seem to kind of get it wrong at the extremes. They tend to be trend followers. And so, you know, they're they're all in at the extremes, right? Well, equity traders uh, that is large specs, uh, actually reduced their net short position by about 16,000 contracts uh, this past week to negative 73,000. That's a significant 
a reduction from the extremes that existed uh, just a couple of months ago, right? So um, the flip side of that, who owns the other side of the trade? Well, it's commercials. Uh, commercials, uh, you know, own about 73,000 contracts on the long side. And so, you know, how do we think about that? Well, in the context of of this level of positioning in the S&P E-mini futures contract, which is the most liquid contract, the most widely traded contract in the S&Ps, um, you know, it looks as though, statistically speaking, that large specs are now becoming more bullish, right? And uh, the flip side is commercials are becoming more bearish. Well, you know, as the as the uh, uh, folklore goes, it's the commercials you should be betting your money on. And if the commercials are bearish, then um, it's a pretty good bet that, you know, they've got it right. They typically do. Um, if we look at the bond market positioning, it's exactly the opposite. Um, right now, large speculative traders have their largest short position that they've had in, you know, uh, many, many moons. You know, I think it's a negative 239,000 contracts right now that they're short. And so, you know, what does that mean? It means that large specs are extremely bearish uh, about the bond market right now. And uh, the flip side is large commercials are extremely bullish. They have the exact opposite positioning. And so uh, when we think about that, um, that would make sense. Commercials are bullish on bonds because they probably believe there's going to be a recession this year or next year, and they're bearish on stocks for the same reason. And so um, I think that positioning is uh, relevant to um, how investors should be thinking about the market for the next, you know, say, six to 12 month time horizon. So, Jeff, this next chart that we're going to discuss really hit home because it's a topic we've talked about on and off the air for several weeks and months, probably even a couple of years now. But uh, consumer spending, um, credit card utilization has been hitting new all time highs and consumer hasn't looked to slow down anytime soon. But it looks like things might have started to change now. Yeah, so let's uh, let's walk this through from uh, the bottom up. So credit card debt has now reached a new all-time record extreme, well above a trillion dollars now, okay? Um, but not everybody, uh, you know, lets their, their balances roll and, and build up into uh, large credit card debt. In fact, um, many, many people pay their balance off every single month. You know, uh, certainly the the top echelon of, uh, you know, earners in uh, the economy tend to pay off those balances. And so, you know, it's actually a better way to, um, you know, get a sense of, of consumer uh, demand trends by looking at transaction data rather than balance data, right? And so Citigroup, which is one of the largest credit card issuers on the planet, uh, has some pretty good data. And they've actually published this uh, report uh, publicly. And, uh, you know, the transaction data suggests that it's actually been in decline for some time, for the last year. Uh, but what's really important right now is that they just posted the lowest year-over-year -year transaction growth. That's volumes, right? Transaction volume growth, which were down 10.8% in September. And it's the lowest year-over-year -year growth since April of 2020, when the economy shut down because of the pandemic. Uh, that should really raise some eyebrows out there. It suggests that people aren't spending, uh, you know, Wealthy people aren't spending, middle class people aren't spending, and people that are utilizing credit cards uh, to for sustenance, right? Uh, they're not spending either, probably because their cards are completely maxed out based on you know credit card debt trends that we've seen, these balance trends. And so, you know, at the end of the day, I think this is confirmatory data uh, that is confirming what we've been seeing in retail sales for some time a deterioration in retail sales, a deterioration in, in card, year-over-year uh, -year card transaction volumes. Uh, and, uh, you know, this is not going to be good uh, for the economy since 70% of uh, economic activity in the U.S. is hinged directly to consumer spending. And so, you know, we see this as kind of a leading indicator for what we've been expecting for some time, uh, a, uh, a flat-out recession to uh, reveal itself in the U.S. sometime in the back half of this year, obviously the fourth quarter going forward, and uh, to carry deep into the fourth quarter of 2024. So, so we're looking for a prolonged and deep recession, and we think these trends suggest that it's beginning right now. 
So let's have a look at some technicals, Jeff. I know that you're very, you're, you're still very negative on the bigger picture. We we've seen all that side, and, and we went for it, you know, quite deeply last week on uh, on your monthly piece. What are your thoughts in the short term, though? Well, you know, it's it's a great question, Mehdi. Um, we've had this big decline, about nine point one percent from the peak in uh, July, July twenty seventh, into the October third low. Now um, that decline looks to us to be incomplete. Uh, there've been a number of people out there calling it a, a three wave corrective uh, waveform. We don't see it that way. Uh, we count five waves down uh, into the uh, October, sorry, August 18th low. We count three waves up into the September high. And then from that point, we, we count an incomplete uh, uh, impulse pattern. We've got, you know, at minute degree of trend, uh, wave one and wave two, and we believe wave three uh, ended probably uh, last week, possibly October 3rd. And if that's the case, that we've seen what appears to be a flat wave, corrective waveform trace out over the last several sessions that may be um, you know, ending today. Uh, we've retraced about 38.2% of Fibonacci uh, ratio that's very, very common for fourth waves. Uh, the most common retracement level for fourth waves. And uh, we're talking a very small degree of trend here, minute wave degree uh, and of minor wave three down. So if we're correct about that, then we should see uh, minute wave five, a fifth wave plunge into minor wave three low. Now, um, we think that minor wave three could extend. And uh, if it doesn't, we think we'll get a quick uh, retracement, which will be minor wave four, probably another lateral consolidation, something shallow, might take a week or two uh, to play out. But we think ultimately uh, the plunge in uh, wave five down at a uh, minor degree of trend will be significant and likely carry the market all the way down into the 3,800 level before it's complete. So um, you know, the way we've kind of traced it out in the chart you're looking at today is we think minor wave three should end around, say, 4,050 on the S&P. That will complete the head and shoulders top measured move target, uh, which, which counts to, depending exactly how you're counting it, 470 to the 450 range. Uh, so we'll give it a little latitude and say 4,050. Um, we think that, uh, you know, counter trend advance uh, back up, uh, you know, perhaps to somewhere near this prior fourth wave that we're putting in right now uh, certainly would be a possibility. And then, you know, a fifth wave plunge at minor degree of trend to complete um, intermediate wave one down. We'd expect that to terminate somewhere around the March lows, which gets us to S&P 3,800. I don't have an exact time frame on that, but I think it could happen sometime before the end of November. There's um, really uh, four more Montgomery cycle turn dates that come into play between uh, October 14th and November 27th. And so uh, we've detailed this all in our in our uh, uh, newsletter. So I'd encourage your viewers to uh, take a look at it and, and get, you know, look at that chart in detail and, and get that perspective, uh, because I think it's, it's significant. So looking at the levels and such, but how, how is uh, how are the internals of the S&P 500 looking? Internals continue to be weak, uh, Matty. We did see breadth expand last week, but the five-week moving average of breadth uh, remains negative, deeply negative, uh, negative 10.5%, I believe. And uh, it's broken its rising trend line. And so whenever we see um, you know, a series of lows that line up perfectly on a trend line, you know, the market's telling you something. It's telling you that there's an advance in place. The market knows that this is here, right? And uh, once those those levels give way, it suggests something's changed. The character of the market's changed, right? And so that that narrowing of breadth uh, that we're seeing in the S and P 500, I think, is is um, important. And we'll, we'll touch on another point here in a second. Um, let's talk about momentum. Momentum again also broke its rising trend line and and collapsed into oversold territory very briefly. It's bounced out of that with uh, Friday's reversal day. Uh, but I think the test of oversold is is an initial point. I, I think you get deeply oversold first and then reverse. And so I don't think this is over. And then, of course, we look at net advancing volume. And, you know, I prefer rather than to look at week to week where, you know, uh, net advancers last week were up about 75 percent of the S&P's uh, constituents uh, closed 
up with up volume. Uh, but if we look at a five week moving average of, of up volume divided by down volume, the ratio is about 1.24. Well, that's barely off the low of 1.11. And uh, honestly, anything below two to one is, is weak, right? Uh, we think a bull market would be something like five to one on a five week moving average. And so, um, you know, this is, this is incredibly weak. And honestly, if we're looking at S&P 500 alone, uh, new lows last week, new 52 week lows, there were 86 new 50 week, two week lows, I'm sorry, 110 new 52 week lows and six new 52 week highs. And so, you know, if this is a big bull market run, that's how it closed out for the week. And uh, 52 week lows were, you know, something like uh, 20 times, 20 to one uh, new 52 week high. So I wouldn't really uh, put a mark in the W column for the bulls just yet. That's quite the divergence between uh, new highs and new lows. Um, any real, uh, any material changes in investor sentiment? Yeah, I'd say we saw some changes. You know, last time we talked about this chart, um, it was pretty neutral, right? Almost dead neutral. And things have um, deteriorated from that point, but we're nowhere near an extreme yet, Mehdi. Um, You know, the name exposure index got as low as 15% a year ago in October. Right now, it's 36% and change. Uh, that compares to about 54% two weeks ago. And so, you know, it's deteriorated, but we're still in neutral territory, in my opinion. Um, you know, the individual investors, as uh, indicated by the AAII survey data, this comes out every Wednesday, uh, we did see the, uh, the bulls downtick from about 31.5% to about 30.1%. Uh, but the bears, the number of investors out there that call themselves bears, uh, that jumped significantly, about 10 percentage points to 41.6%. So the bull bear spread has increased from minus 3.6% to minus 11.5%. Um, that's a significant change. However, it is, you know, orders of magnitude better than the, the lows that were in place a year ago. Uh, a year ago, that bull bear spread got down to negative 42%. And so, you know, we're just nowhere near an extreme at this point. Um, one other data point that, uh, you know, is not in the chart, and that's the investor's intelligence data of uh, professional investment advisors, people like myself. How many of those regard themselves as bears? Well, as of last week, uh, unchanged at 23.9% which is still very, very low. The recent low was 18%. Uh, the recent high was 43%. And uh, um, I think that whenever you get bears down, you know, around 20%, that indicates still a fairly bullish uh, cohort of investors out there. And so, you know, most, most advisors remain relatively bullish. In fact, in fact about 43%. Uh, that's down from about 49% at the peak. So, you know, um, I, I think the number of bearish uh, advisors is the, the most important criteria right now, and very few bears, relatively speaking, and, and certainly relative to last October when, you know, well over 40% uh, were bearish at that time. We're just nowhere near that now. I know which camp you sit in, so uh, we don't need to go down that side. <laughs> um, Jeff, it wouldn't be a show if we didn't mention the Magnificent Seven. Um, who's leading the charge at this point in our little, uh, our favorite little group here? Yeah, as you know, this is a, a group of seven stocks. They're mega cap tech stocks. The group includes, uh, you know, Google, Amazon, Apple, Microsoft, uh, Nvidia, Meta, and Tesla. Right? Those are the names. So, uh, you know. Who's leading? Well, last week, they all saw a big pop, and they all popped on Friday, really significantly. Uh, but for the week, you know, the leaders were uh, Google, I think NVIDIA, and Meta. They were all up around 5%. The big loser was uh, Amazon. Amazon was only up about 0.66%. Uh, Apple and Microsoft were up like three and a half. So, you know, the majority of the names were up between, say, you know, four, three to 5%. Uh, but, you know, Amazon was a real laggard there. I'm not sure specifically why. Uh, perhaps it had to do with the spending data that came out, uh, you know, because they're a big retailer. Uh, they're a tech company, but they're really a retailer. And so uh, something to consider there. Um, the thing that I would say is that, um, you know, 
when mega caps like this pop, it's a flight to safety more than anything. And so I don't think it's bullish that these stocks are up. I actually think that it looks more like it plays into the bear case. Understood. So what do we do, Jeff? How do we position ourselves? Can we have a look at uh, some sectors and where you'd like to be more heavily weighted and you know, look at things on a valuation basis and maybe a relative strength side as well? Yeah, so um, I could say that last week, uh, tech had a big comeback and energy was the worst performer last week. Took a real deep breath down some 5%. Um, you know, I think uh, if we're looking at valuations right now, I got to look at energy and say, this is the cheapest sector by orders of magnitude across market cap scale on a forward PE basis. And so, you know, when I look at tech, it's the most overvalued sector. And so comparing tech to energy, I'd want to be more long energy and uh, more short tech or underweight tech. I think tech is uh, tech and telecom or, or com services sectors in general, uh, coupled with discretionary, which are really now starting to feel the brunt of, uh, you know, um, slowdown in consumer spending, weakness in travel stocks, uh, hotel and airline stocks specifically, especially with what's going on geopolitically right now. Um, this this begs to, um, you know, I guess it really, really points to um, where is the relative strength, right? Those are at most risk of a big momentum reversal. I think energy, healthcare, uh, those two really stand out as, though, as, as benefiting most from relative strength trends over, say, the last five weeks. Thank you for that, Jeff. And uh, before we wrap, I, I just want to highlight that you obviously still publish with your top actionable trade ideas, which you've always loved. And I would urge our viewers to check out your note for further details. But one thing I noticed this week was you generally have five longs, five shorts. This time you have a, a heavier weighting on the short side. I think it was six and 10 or something, um, but you definitely outweighed on the short side. Is this indicative of the start of this bearish downturn to you? Well, it's really interesting. I just mentioned this in the S&P data where it was like 20 to one new 52-week lows over new 52-week highs. It's 10 to one in the broad market. So, you know, there were something like uh, 300 and, no, I think it's more, maybe more like 650 new 52-week lows across 5,700 stocks in the NYSE and NASDAQ composite. And I think it was like 60 new highs. And so, you know, it was 10 to one 52 week lows to 52 week highs. Um, that's a big, um, you know, disparity, right? And so, you know, I looked at a lot of charts this week and many, I really could not find any bullish charts out there. I mean, the six that I put out were just really big leaders with making new 52 week highs. Uh, the 10 that I listed were kind of like the 10 best, uh, you know, top, you know, 5% or something like that uh, of S&P stocks, five, top 10% of S&P, uh, you know, worst, worst stocks. And so I'd say, you know, if I had to commit capital uh, one way or the other, I'd be biasing on the short side. And in, in our own, uh, you know, the way we're invested uh, in our, in our uh, family office accounts, uh, we are net short right now. And so, you know, our view is, uh, you know, we eat, our, we eat our own cooking, right? So our view is, is expressed in our long shorts. And we are definitely uh, have a short bias right now. Understood. Jeff, thank you so much for sharing your thoughts from Alpha Insights. Always appreciated. Always a pleasure. And I want to thank our viewers. Don't forget to check out Jeff's content on Substack at hugeinsights.substack.com. Until next time, thank you for watching and good luck investing.